Welcome in to the Paul Kuharski podcast. I'm Paul Kuharski of paulkuharski.com. Thanks for joining me. I've mentioned my name three times. I'm part of the 440 network and I'm brought to you by Jaspers. Uh, today, we're going to talk about analytics and stats that tell us something about the things that the Titans need to be fixing from last year that they should be working on uh, through this offseason into this break that's going on now. Um, some of those things, telltale signs from last year, first down efficiency, fourth down scoring, some other things of interest to me personally, their use of motion, um, some details about kickoffs. I also want to tell you about how U13 uh, baseball this summer has converted me to a degree on one of the things that I've kind of disputed that Mike Vrabel has uh, has had as one of his mantras um, or one of his explanations about when his team goes flat. Uh, Please, you're with me. Let's dive right in. I want to start with the motion stuff. And, and a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk with you about in this episode um, comes from good statistical stuff, from good statistical people that's been out there on, on Twitter. So Seth Walder of ESPN Stats and Info uh, put together a graphic, including teams uh, from last season, the teams that made the playoffs, their playoff numbers are, uh, are included. It was spurred really by Kansas City's two Super Bowl touchdowns. You remember the uh, the inside motion that just gave the Eagles such a hard time when the Chiefs scored two touchdowns and didn't adapt to to the second play that was very similar to the first play um, and really helped Kansas City win that game. I was chatting with Mike Herndon about this kind of uh, difference. The Titans last year were 28th in uh, motion at the snap. They only had motion at the snap 10.3% of the time, ap- according to this chart, but they used motion overall 54.7% of the time, which was 12th. That's a disparity of 44.4%. Second, I believe only to the Raiders, if I examined this uh, chart correctly. Pre-snap motion, as we know, is largely used just as a man's own indicator. So you send a guy across the formation, you see if somebody's following him or not. If he's followed, it's man. If he's if he's not, it's it's zone, and, and your quarterback and the offense get their clear read on, on the key element of coverage. Um, some of these teams at the top of the list basically send a ghost guy in motion very often and he becomes a late option near the line of scrimmage. Miami is number one um, in in both of these categories. Baltimore does it with a tight end or a fullback. They're number two. The Packers and the Rams do it as well. Kansas City in the Super Bowl, which I referred to, is different because that was the first option on those plays, and that feels kind of new, right? That's something that's kind of developing in the league now. In the red zone, those things are becoming more of a popular feature because of how many teams choose to play man near the goal line, and that makes it complicated. The motion at the snap getting popular in recent years is a way to destabilize, if you will, the defense at the snap, and then it creates the potential for mental errors because the defense has to – dissect things very quickly, communicate things very quickly, and it's offense advantage, right? I'd like to see the Titans be someone who does more of that in 2023. Now, one reason that maybe we didn't see it as much is because the Titans had the second fewest red zone uh, possessions in the NFL. So, if it's going on primarily in the red zone or if that's the place where you could use it the most to hurt people and the Titans weren't in that region of the field as much as everybody else, it would make sense that their um, use of it, their percentage of uh, times with the motion at the snap would be lower. So we all know they need to get in the red zone more often and maybe if they're in, they're in the red zone more often, we would see them, we will see them do it more often. 
I got a relatively generic answer from Tim Kelly earlier this offseason, not the last time he talked, but two times ago when he talked, when I asked him about, uh, you know, if there would be more motion in his offense as compared to the offense that we saw um, from Todd Downey. Yeah, I think uh, obviously if we if we feel like that's what's best for us and, in, in, you know, against that opponent, we're going to utilize it. Um, you know, motions can do can do a lot of things for you. They can, um, you know, they can provide you advantage in terms of leverage, in terms of grass, in terms of numbers, um, cause communication or cause the defense to communicate. Uh, but it can also do some things that where if you don't get an expected look, it can kind of throw a wrench in your plan. So, uh, you know, as a coaching staff, we're doing a good job of, of making sure that we're going through and studying um you know, how different defenses kind of uh, uh, approach and, and handle different types of motions. And if we feel like it's going to be advantageous for us, we're going to utilize it. It can kind of throw a wrench in your plans. Titans always tend towards conservatism in such circumstances, but these teams that are doing it constantly seem to be more innovative, if you will. Certainly Miami is, and it doesn't seem to throw a wrench in their plans. So it's something I'm curious about. Uh, and that I think we should keep an eye on. Wanted to move on to first down efficiency. Titans incredibly predictable with running the ball with Derrick Henry on first down. They have been throughout the time since he became their lead back. Um, and uh, Warren Sharp, uh, an excellent, excellent analytics and analyst, um, talked about this. I'm going to put up a, uh, a graphic here. If you're watching on YouTube, this basically shows um, EPA on, um, on first down runs, expected points added, of course, first down runs versus first down passes. Titans EPA on first down runs, very low. Titans EPA on first down passes, very high. And what Warren Sharp wrote in tweets that are uh, about the Titans, but advertising how much more he'll have about the Titans in his annual uh, preseason book, which is a must read. And in my opinion says on first downs, Tennessee had the second highest run rate, despite defenses stacking the box at the fourth highest run rate. Unsurprisingly, the runs ranked fourth worst in efficiency, but nothing stopped them from running into loaded boxes not even the fact that first down passes ranked third in efficiency. There is no reason a team that sits where the Titans sit on this graphic should be running the ball at the second highest rate in the NFL. Absolutely no reason. I think every Titans fan in the country, in the world, absolutely agrees with that. That was the Todd Downing, Todd Downing-ing, of the Titans offense. Now they've been predictable with Derrick Henry on first down runs since he took over as the lead back, but this was them at their most predictable with it. And it's just, uh, it was criminal. Um, and what, what having that does for you is buys you incredible opportunities to be as efficient as that chart says, as the numbers say, they can be as a first down passing offense. So it's all right to be very Derrick Henry heavy on first down, just not as Derrick Henry heavy as they've been. Because what it does is teams are playing for it. Teams are always going to play you for it. But you bring it down a significant percent, I don't know, 10, 12, 15. I, I'm not a numbers guy. I don't, I don't have that graph, and I don't understand the, uh, the, the balance of that teeter-totter. But you bring down the runs and take advantage of that passing efficiency on first down, and boy, do you look smart. And boy, can you take advantage of that first down passing efficiency to set yourself up for not third and short, but for second and short. Or, get this, for first and 10. Wouldn't that be something to get a first down on first down? And Todd Downing said he was trying to set up third and short. 
ultimately through first and second down. But some of the best offenses in the league we've seen are trying to avoid third down altogether. And the Titans have, have not really ever aimed to do that philosophically. Last Derrick Henry running on first down can create better situations for the entire offense because the first down passing efficiency can be so good based on the defense's expectations of so much Derrick Henry on first down. And remember, here's one thing that's concerning. How much when Tim Kelly said that the Titans offense was not predictable, is that him just trying to be kind to Todd Downing? And how much is that him believing that super heavy Derrick Henry runs on first down were not predictable? Titans fans should be praying that he was just being kind to Todd Downing now with the New York Jets. I'm brought to you by Jasper's, a fine restaurant and bar on West End Avenue, not far from 40 in downtown Nashville. Look, it's a great spot. I was recently there. I had the Cuban sandwich. Too big for me to finish, which is not common when it comes to me having breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I checked out the grab-and-go market. You can get all kinds of drink mixes, a bottle of wine, a couple of beers. A uh, cool little shop there for Nashville souvenirs, too, if you've got a guest in town and you want to take them out to lunch. Free pop a shot and air hockey and uh, ski ball and more. Free parking, which is huge. Go there for a business meeting, a date night. Any kind of occasion is the right occasion to go to Jasper's. Excellent food and drinks. I can't recommend them enough. Make it part of your plan this week, and I thank them for their support. Listen, it's ridiculous most of the time to take anything related to our kids' games and compare it to NFL football. I understand that. But here's a living, breathing example of it, and I've wrestled with Mike Vrabel over this one idea. When the Titans come out flat, we've discussed their lack of energy, who's bringing the energy because they don't have too many guys that are outwardly, you know, waving their arms, talking, yelling, all of that stuff. They have a lot of low key individuals. And now Taylor Lewan's gone. He was one of those uh, most vibrant, active guys. And he's been asked a lot of questions over over the his five years about w- when things are flat, who's bringing the energy. And he's always said, the energy doesn't bring the plays. The plays bring the energy. You, you got to make a play. You make a play and the energy comes. So I was at a U13 baseball tournament in uh, Albertville, Alabama over the weekend, the long weekend, pool play Friday double elimination bracket Saturday and Sunday. And my son's team, finally, everything came together for them. It was the right level of competition. They played really good baseball, but they were behind in the semifinals on Saturday night and had to rally twice to come back and win that game. They were behind in the championship game and had to rally to come back in that game. And when they were down, they were flat and we were encouraging them to show the same energy when they were down that they had shown in the games before when they were up, to show the same energy that they had when they mounted the first comeback in the semifinal uh, in order to mount the second comeback, which they needed. And they found it very difficult. You know, the body language fades and, you know, the, the dancing that they do to the music in between innings and all of that disappears. And, you know, talking amongst parents, talking to my wife, my wife is saying, you know, why can't they get that energy going that out of that energy is going to come good things. And I, I tend to agree, but I conveyed Vrabel's philosophy here that it wasn't going to be the energy that was going to bring the play. It was going to be somebody making a play that was going to get the energy going. And sure enough, 
that's what happened for them as they finished off a five and oh run and, and, and won this thing. Um, and so, you know, here's a, a micro level of, of sports and you see kind of the psychology of the players is already in, in place in a way that Vrabel seems to very clearly <laughs> understand and i think probably is is right about now you know i still think it would be good if there were some guys who were able to kind of sustain it through the lows for you know the east coast Sox and for the tennessee titans and for any team when things are going bad if there's somebody that could still you know maintain that energy level but the fact of the matter is the thing that really gets the energy level going is, is uh, the base hit to, to start an inning or the first down play that gets you going or the big third down stop that gets you off the field. And I'm 75% of the way to converting to Vrabel's thinking here. I think he knows what he's talking about on this one. He knows what he's talking about on a, on a lot of stuff, but there's, there's room to arm wrestle on some stuff. And I've arm wrestled with them on this in, in things that I've written, but uh, I'm close to convert. Fourth quarters. We knew that the Titans were terrible in the fourth quarter last year. Pitiful. I'm going to give you a big reminder here. Watch this. If you're, with me on YouTube and I'll read it out for everybody else. Six losses with a third quarter lead or tie at the end of the third quarter, the Titans were winning or tied six times last year and they lost the game 10 times in 17 games. They did not score in the fourth quarter and they scored 37 points in the fourth quarter last year, a whopping per game average of 2.18, 2.18 points per game in the fourth quarter. More from Warren Sharp on this. He said, Tennessee would have had the fifth best record in the NFL if games ended after the third quarter last year. Now, that's a nice fantasy land. We know that they do not end after the fourth quarter. But the Titans would have been 11-4-2. and two. And the AFC's third seed behind only Buffalo and Baltimore. Kansas City would have been fourth. Miami would have been fifth. The Chargers would have been sixth. The Bengals would have been seventh out of the playoffs. Cleveland would have been eighth. New England would have been ninth. Las Vegas would have been 10th. The Jaguars, who we know won the division, would have been 11th, and they would have finished 7, 9, and 1. Compared again to the Titans, who would have been 11, 4, and 2. Titans and the fourth quarter, this is a team that in Vrabel's tenure in the first four years, did a good job in the fourth quarter, did a good job coming back to the point that, you know, everybody, a uh, lot of analytics people would write after a season, you know, well, one of the reasons the Titans aren't going to be as good this year is because they're going to regress to the mean in terms of uh, come from behind wins. They're going to regress to the mean in terms of, uh, fourth quarter, you know, uh, comebacks and, um, and all of those things. Well, they did it for a couple of years in a row where they were just a good finishing team. And I wrote, isn't it possible that a team can just be a good finishing team? Isn't it possible that Mike Rabel and his staff and his roster is good at finishing well? And they were for a time. Now this roster was not last year, but this roster was depleted. I mean, you think of the guys who were out down the stretch and uh, look, if you don't have your starting quarterback in the NFL, you're not going to have a great deal of success. And the Titans didn't 
They lost seven in a row down the stretch. Um, and in the key games, they were without Ryan Tannehill, where they turned to M- Malik Willis, who simply wasn't ready, and Josh Dobbs, who was better than that, but is not an NFL starter for a reason. And so, uh, you know, those fourth quarter comebacks um, and the inability to sustain a f- third quarter lead or to take off in a game that they were tied in just wasn't there. Um, Todd Downing, an excuse. Um, The guys on the field, an excuse. Daly is a left tackle trying to to protect uh, backup quarterbacks, et cetera, et cetera. We know all the reasons. But the Titans have to get back to being a much better fourth quarter team. Um, And I'm, I'm sure this has been covered to no end by them um, throughout this this off season. When I go to kickoffs here, uh, this is not a clear cut um, area that that uh, that I've got some grand plan for them to improve. Though I, I think they can always be better on special teams, where they've largely been a middling team during uh, the Titans tenure though I think Shudak or Wolf with a bigger leg will give them more options. Titans only kicked the ball off 69 times last year. That was the second fewest in the NFL to the Texans at 68. That surprised me a little bit when I looked back at it. Houston was 3, 13, and 1. Tennessee was 7, and 10. But Houston was tied for 30th at uh, 17 points a game. They scored only 9 points fewer than Tennessee, 28th at 17.5 points a game. So neither of them were getting the ball, giving it to their kicker to kick off very often. There were only uh, eight teams with a lower touchback percentage than the Titans, uh, 53.6. On those kickoffs, um, success of not getting past the six, uh, the 25 yard line. So when it wasn't a touchback, uh, 84.1% of the time, the Titans opponent did not get it past the 25 yard line. These numbers are all from uh, Twitter at Doug underscore analytics. So the 34.8% of the time that they kicked short of the end zone, Average ball came down at the six yard line and the average drive start was at the 25.9. So they're basically giving up an extra yard from a touchback, which is not anything to get super disturbed by. Um, What was their intent, right? Is Randy Bullock's mediocre leg landing them short of the end zone more often than they want to be? Or were they trying to instigate returns some of the time? I think more often than not, it was Bullock's leg. Um, Sometimes probably they were trying to get a return, but more often Bullock couldn't get it there, right? He only tried two field goals of 50 yards or longer all season. Um, So I would think that they could put the ball in the end zone more often, but things are going to change this year because – a kickoff returner can wave for a fair catch any point inside the 25 and get the ball at the 25. Whoever their kicker is out of, out of Shudak and Wolf has a bigger leg. If it's one of these two guys, and if it's not one of these two guys, it's going to be somebody else with a bigger leg. Um, But I think because the Titans have invested in guys who cover well, or they believe that cover well, I'm thinking here of Luke Gifford in particular, who was a free agent signing, but Chance Campbell should be good at this. We didn't see him because he was hurt. Uh, Hassan Haskins was very good at it last year. And Nick Westbrook Akine um, is, is good at it. They've got other guys who are good at it. I would imagine that um, Mike Vrabel, who's a pretty smart and innovative coach, is going to isn't going to just sit back and accept that teams are going to wave uh, to catch regular kickoffs and start at the 25 yard line. 
that they'll try some um, line drives and squibs that will force teams to field the ball in a way where they don't automatically get it at the 25 and that give the Titans a chance to tackle inside the 25. We'll see. That's yet to be determined what the Titans have come up with, what other teams in the league have come up with that the Titans might see and want to, to copy or borrow or spin off of or all of that. But um, there's a lot to be determined here. Um, last year on the 65-plus uh, percent of kickoffs into the end zone, 91% were rated as successful, didn't get beyond the 25-yard line. 80% of them were touchbacks. 20% of them averaged the 25.1-yard line, so barely a game. So if they kicked it into the end zone, everything was just fine. Um, Titans should have a pretty good defense. If you're going to let the opposing team start at the 25, generally speaking, things should be okay. But you want to find yards where you can. And if you get them to the 20, uh, hell, you can get them to the 22, to the 20, to the 18. You're going to take it. And I'm sure they're going to look for ways to be able to do that. Um, so we shall see. I appreciate you joining me for this edition of the Paul Kuharski podcast. I've got some vacation coming up, so I'm not sure about how regular I will be over the course of the next three weeks when I will be bouncing around uh, with my family for some baseball tournaments and other stuff. Certainly if, uh, if there's news, I will bounce on otherwise maybe a little while before I talk to you here again, but I, I appreciate your loyalty. Tell your friends, this is front door to Paul Kuharski.com. It's a good time to line up your membership to be ready to go. Um, as we ramp into training camp in not too long several weeks, but uh, then it'll be full blast. So uh, I look forward to seeing your registration and uh, I will talk to you again very soon. Thanks for being here. Thanks to Jaspers. Uh, don't lock the box and be sure to lock your locks.